Hey, kids cook real food. Katie Kimball here for the Healthy Parenting Connector, where as always, we are here to connect parents who so desire to raise healthy kids with the experts who have the information they need. And I have recently been blessed to um, be introduced to Dr. Pejman Katarai, um, a holistic pediatrician in California, and his depth and breadth of experience is incredible. I'm so pleased to have you here today. Thank you. A pleasure to be here. Thank you for, for this opportunity. Um, I'm really excited to share with your audience, you know, the little bit that I know and hopefully make a big impact for a lot of people. Well, you're very humble with a little bit. Um, <laughs> but Dr. K, as he's known in his practice, really works with, I, I think, some of the more difficult cases, parents who are just kind of at their wits end. So today we're going to talk about um, the highly sensitive child. And I know last week you were introduced to kind of this idea. And Dr. K is going to talk about how it um, is a constitutional makeup that can easily go out of balance and kind of puts HSCs or HSPs, highly sensitive people, at risk for a lot of suffering that they may not need to experience. So this is going to be super interesting. Let me like officially introduce you to Dr. K real quick. Um, he's one of the few pediatricians in the country who is cross-trained in, are you ready for this? Sit down. Osteopathy, functional and biomedical medicine, allopathic, like he's a regular DO, along with a novel system called endobiogeny, which teaches us to consider how hormones can influence our experience of life, which is probably a little beyond what most of us think when we're thinking about our children. Like, oh, they have they have hormones too? Yes, they do. So he founded and directed the Loma Linda Pediatric Holistic Medicine Clinic for seven years. He runs his own clinic, Holistic Kids and Families in Santa Monica, California. And um, he's just an expert in like understanding and digging, digging to the root cause of some of these most severe kids' behavioral issues. Um, and most importantly, he's a dad of a thriving little one and one on the way. Congrats on that, Dr. Thank K. You. Thank you. That's yeah. so cool. So let's start with your story. Like, how did you end up with this crazy breadth of experience and degrees? And what drew you to do peds to focus on kids? So the pediatric story, I guess, is, is really funny because when I was uh, in residency or actually in medical school, uh, I actually was thinking of leaving medicine altogether. I, I really did not like medical practice. And, you know, after two or three years in medical school, I said, you know, this is not for me. Uh, so I was thinking of going into business administration and hospital administration. And then literally two days into my pediatric rotation, I, I tell everyone it's like unicorns and, you know, rainbows and butterflies. And it was just the most magical experience I could have ever imagined. So I, I did basically an about, uh, you know, pivot. And I, I say the kids picked me. Um, you know, it's been 15 years since my residency more. And uh, I, I every day still adore these kids. And, you know, it makes everything worthwhile. And everything I do is, is for the kids. So you ask, you know, why do I have this ridiculous amount of training? It's because I, I've seen kids suffer and I, I needed to find answers. And, you know, th this has been the journey because, you know, when I went into functional medicine and biomedical medicine, and it's, it's profound, you know, functional medicine is awesome. But after practicing functional medicine for seven years, I hit this wall where 30, 40% of my kids weren't getting better. Mm. You know, I did the diets, I did the gut protocols, I did the detoxes, I did all of these things. And some of my kids were just not getting better. And it was either that I didn't know what I was doing and I checked with others and I was doing exactly everything everyone else is doing. And that's when I said, well, there has to be more to this picture. And that's been the thing with osteopathy. You know, I learned it really well. I don't do it, but I, I know everything about it. And it was the same thing, like, well, there has to be more, there has to be more. And all of this has been a journey for me to learn as much as I can to help these children, because watching a child suffer, I mean, makes everyone's heart ache, right? It's, yeah. it's the most horrible thing to see a little child suffer. And for me, the behavioral issues, one, because I was one of those kids, so I, I can oh, wow. actually relate to them. You know, I was the kid with anxiety. I was the kid that didn't want to leave the house. I, I went through, you know, rather severe bouts of depression. I have a lot of the sensory sensitivity. So I'm definitely an HSB by all of the definitions. My daughter uh -huh. is too. Uh, and you know, when, when I see these kids suffering, I think there's a part of me that sees myself in them. Mm. And there's this drive to do everything humanly possible to help them. 
And it, it's, it's, it's so sad because there are kids that come into my practice and, you know, they've been blamed for acting out because people don't understand them. So I have eight year olds that, you know, look at me and say, am I bad? You know, am I a bad person? And no eight year old should ever have to contemplate if they're a bad person. Mm. But because everyone around them blames them for being the kid that acts out, the kid that doesn't sit still, the kid that freaks out in certain scenarios, whereas we just don't understand that these kids are wired differently, that they're, they're, they have an internal suffering that we just don't understand. And that is what has driven me to do, you know, now 10 plus years of training and research and, you know, study, because th there, there's this part of me that wants to do everything possible to help these kids. Because sure. again, I, I see myself in them. Yeah, so there's something in these kids with the behavior that's just off the charts, that's in their physiology, that I feel like you can see that so many others can't. And what a beautiful story that you were basically just tapped on the shoulder and handed like, you're, you're the kid's guy. Like, this is your passion. And I love too that you are so passionate about it. You're really looking to help these kids, like 30 to 40% not getting better, plenty of people would be like, wow, like I'm helping 60 to 70% of my people. This is amazing. And you're like, no, no one is left behind at yeah. Dr. K's office. So what is it that makes your approach so different with kids' behavior, different than psychologists, different than MDs, and even different than other like functional and integrative practitioners? What are you seeing that they don't? Well, you know, it, it's really about putting all the pieces together. Okay. And this is one of the things that I've learned. You know, the functional medicine only like to look at it through the functional medicine lens. The osteopaths only look at it through the osteopathic lens. If you go see occupational therapists, they only look at it through the OT lens. So what I have done over the last, you know, 10 plus years is gone and, and learned how each person sees it, learned what they do, learned how to do it, or in certain cases, at least know how they do it and just kind of put it into one matrix. So basically I've just kept collecting their perspectives and made it into one uniform holistic perspective. And in a way, when I'm talking to these families, I'm filtering their information through 10 or 15 different lenses. Mm -hmm. And I can say, okay, you, you probably have this. This, is, this sounds like mold. This sounds like a metabolic issue. This sounds like a gut issue. This sounds like a hormone. This is osteopathic. This is mm -hmm. OT. So I could literally filter through all of these things. So it's like 15 people sitting there at the same time listening, except they're all in my head. Yeah. And how many times do we hear families say, oh, we've been to eight different specialists. We've been to 12 different specialists, right? Because yeah. each specialist doesn't have the one answer that they yeah. need. So you have this like crazy magnification of all the lenses stacked on top, you know, like setting a fire with your <laughs> bifocals or something. <laughs> no, not really fire. Fire is maybe a bad example, but like that's, that's the power. That's the power yeah. of what you can do. Um, so let's talk about this highly sensitive child thing. What kind of overarching does it mean to be a highly sensitive child or, or HSC for short? Well, so th there's certain parts of the constitution that, that really create this. So first of all, when you look at it, HSCs or HSPs are highly aware, right? They tend to be more alert, more aware than most other individuals. So this is generally part of our biochemistry. So a lot of us, if you actually did the genetics, we have mutations in our COMT, catecholamine M transferase, GAD uh, receptors. So these are basically enzymes and receptors in our brain that control our adrenaline levels. So mm. people like us generally can't break down adrenaline as easily as others. And that's why, for instance, if you talk to a lot of adults, they'll say, I can't drink coffee because I get jittery. Or I, like, I, I was talking to someone over the weekend and they're like, I had a cup of coffee a month ago and I was having a panic attack. These are all, coffee basically boosts catecholamines. And if you can't break them down, what happens is you, you start having these anxiety experiences because your brain chemistry is different than other people. So we have just in a very gener generic sense, we have mutations in our brain, which, which are just part of the population. So we're mm -hmm. the 10, 15% who have a difference in our genetic makeup of how we process our brain chemicals. And because of that, the way our chemical milieu in our head is, is different than the rest of the population. Mm -hmm. And when you look at some of these kids early on, these are the babies that don't sleep as much. You know, they're, they're the 
two week old that are sitting there eyes wide open and just looking at the world. You know, mm -hmm. the other baby is sleeping 18, 20 hours a day. And here's the kid that's awake. And you're like, who are you? You know, uh, they're the kids that take in more of their environment because of this, it's because our, our brains are just wired to be way more alert mm -hmm. than other individuals. A lot of us, so 30% of the population have sensory processing issues which means, or processing disorders. So how we process information from the environment around us is sometimes a little bit flawed. And if you look at, you know, Erin's writings, one of the things that she does a beautiful job talking about is that, you know, we're a little too sensitive to light, too sensitive to sound. Some of us have a hard time with, you know, wearing rough clothing. These are all signs of a sensory processing disorder. Now, because our brain chemistry is really uh, high, the adrenaline levels, we tend to experience more. But if there is an error in, in how our brain is wired to take the information in, that then gets jutted over the edge. And what is just a high level of awareness becomes actually a disorder. So, and that, that's, that's the way to kind of differentiate uh, our, our community, if you want to say, mm -hmm. so I'm speaking to, to other HSBs and, you know, parents of these highly sensitive children, because I think having the awareness is a gift with this gift comes a burden, which is that we can also go out of balance far more easily than others. Mm -hmm. Another uh, element of our makeup is actually your hormones. So a lot of HSBs also have slight hormonal differences where, for instance, if you were to check, you know, 100 regular people versus HSPs, you'll find subtle differences in our thyroid. So our thyroids tend to run a little bit faster, which also causes part of the creativity, uh, the high degree of imagination. So if you look at the, like the descriptions, you know, we have a very rich internal life. You know, mm -hmm. we can internalize partially to escape our environment because we're overwhelmed by it. But because we also have this extremely active imagination, we can also go into ourselves and create this very elaborate, beautiful world that's disconnected from the rest of society. And that's part of our thyroid. Uh, if you ask really carefully, a lot of parents will say, you know, my child have, they have very vivid dreams. So a lot of the kids, when you ask, they have colorful dreams, they fly in their dreams. They have very rich, colorful, vivid dreams. Uh, these are all part of the constitution that creates this, this cluster of things that ultimately makes us as HSPs. Wow, and which some of that part, sounds like fabulous, right? Like who wouldn't want to be flying in their dreams? And, you know, like <laughs> we all want to suck the marrow out of life and experience more, but there's this risk. It's like you're on the edge you're on a precipice, partly because we were talking before we started recording, the culture is not an incredibly supportive place for yeah. HSPs. Absolutely. Because yeah. coffee, because we, everybody runs on coffee. I mean, that, <laughs> that, <laughs> that kind of distills it down <laughs> maybe a little too simply, but it's like a really good example. Um, so you, you said that a good topic to talk about is why might HSCs be more likely to go haywire? Yeah. So those kids who are just off the wall and their behavior is completely out of control, parents and teachers and, you know, professionals have no idea what to do with them. Is it more likely that they have an HSC at their root? I, I would say the vast majority of the kids that I see, at least 60% of them are HSCs. Mm -hmm. Which is so, much higher than the average population. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, the, you know, with this, like what I said, with this gift, and I, I do see it as a gift because, you know, these are individuals ultimately that can go on to create amazing things. You know, they can become our inventors. They can become the next, the next uh, you know, inventor that changes the world, yeah. you know, whatever. Our, our pediatricians uh, with 15 lenses through which to look. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> if, you, if you weren't highly sensitive, you would not have seen no. all those things. So no. perfect example of why it is a gift. But yeah. And, you know, I, I think to that some of the suffering can open doors in our ability to see things that others would not. Mm -hmm. And with the HSC or HSP, you know, these children see a lot. They, they witness a lot. They experience a lot, which is their gift. When they go out of balance, when I say lovingly, they go haywire, that's when it, it, they just hit this point of overwhelm where it's, it's like the car, you know, you drive it so hard. And then one day, all of a sudden the red engine light comes on and the engine just 
goes flat out, you know, yeah. or transmission fails. In a way, the kids that I see, their, their engines are failing, their transmission is failing, their tires are about to pop. And it, it's one thing after another that's kind of landed on them. So these, the kids, most of the kids I see have a high degree of sensory processing disorder. Mm -hmm. So like, for instance, uh, when, when you look at the description of the HFC, you know, a lot of these kids are indoor kids, right? They, they like to play by themselves. Well, what does that mean? It means that these children cannot tolerate the loud, chaotic environments that they're in. Mm -hmm. And these are actually things that occupational therapists and, you know, for instance, what, the work that you're doing through diet can actually make a profound difference. Because one of the things that I've seen is when children have a lot of inflammation, which is ultimately gut related and diet related, the inflammation actually worsens the sensory issues. So if, if a lot of your parents look, a lot of their children who are HSCs, when they have fevers or illness, it, quite a few of them, some of them will mellow out because actually part of the brain chemistry changes in that way. But some of these kids will also become a lot more anxious. They, mm. they have more sensory heightened. Uh, and that is actually part of the gut inflammatory response or a inflammatory response causing that. Okay. Um, the other piece of this is the sensory issues. So I've, I've had some kids that have started working with the OTs. And then after six months, the kid that couldn't literally couldn't go into a playground with other kids is now the one running into the playground, screaming their head off with their other kids and actually engaging with these other kids. They're still, the age, they're, they're still highly sensitive, mm -hmm. but now they're balanced and now they're functional and now they can be in the world and actually take in the world and be a part of the world while still being themselves. That's great. So your constitution and your sensitivity is not your destiny. Yes. We can make choices. Yes. All right. And, well, yeah, go ahead. And, you know, I think that the, the beauty of, of our understanding today and part of why I feel so blessed to be able to have learned from so many people is that we, we, we have all the tools out there. You know, the OTs are doing magic. There are people that actually work on auditory processing where they can change how we process sound. I mean, it's crazy. They can change how we process sound. So those HSPs or HSCs that, that can't handle too much loud noise, like a crowded restaurant or, you know, a, a big crowded playground or, for instance, the movies, you can actually rewire the brain to actually take in sound differently in a balanced way. So they can actually go enjoy these experiences without their brains completely becoming over, overloaded. How incredible is that? Is. Rather than just remove yourself from the situation, which is our culture, yeah, you can actually kind of can change your constitution. That's awesome. So yeah. you mentioned diet and nutrition. How, how does nutrition, like what role does it play into what highly sensitive kids need? Well, it, it's, it, it's profound. It's, it's ultimately foundational in terms of what these children need. Now, there's one little nuance, which is that a lot of HSCs especially have some degree of oral sensitivity. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I've become very conscious of is never rushing into big diet change because these kids can't handle it. Okay. So in a very responsible, um, sensitive fashion, Ultimately, what we need to do is get these kids off gluten. Gluten is probably the number one irritant for these children. Uh, dairy, to some extent, sugar. So a lot of these kids, when they eat simple carbs or sugar, their blood sugar goes up and down. That blood sugar fluctuation ultimately triggers adrenaline. So these kids that already have a high degree of adrenaline in their brain, their blood sugar drops. How do they bring their blood sugar back? Adrenaline. So they just, it's basically take these kids all of a sudden get a, a quick, uh, you know, shot of espresso or two shots of espresso, except it, it's a five-year-old, mm. you know? And these are the things when parents stand back and look at. And they see like, oh, after school, you know, when my kid hasn't eaten for four hours and I pick them up and they're losing their mind, it's because they haven't eaten. It's not because the mm -hmm. child is being bad. It's because their blood sugar has crashed and they're literally losing their mind. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at what, and again, this is why I appreciate the work that you're doing because it's so amazing that you're connecting families and people back to food. I, I, like, honestly, it's the most incredible thing. And thank you for doing that. But, magic wand <laughs> <laughs> but 
But it, it's so key because, I mean, most of the kids, what do they eat for breakfast? They eat some cereal with milk, right? Or they eat some kind of simple carb, maybe a piece of toast mm-hmm. with a little bit of butter and jam, which is basically a tiny bit of fat, carb, and sugar. Mm-hmm. And what does that do for these kids? An hour or two later, their blood sugar is completely tanked out. And you might as well just give them a little hit of cocaine or several shots of espresso because that's what we're doing to them. Mm. Or, and then they have morning snack at school and it's a fruit roll up or a Rice Krispie yeah. treat. It's the yeah. same, the same, same thing. thing. So that's just like hitting them over and over. It sounds like. Yeah. And, you know, th- th- these are the little pieces that if parents could recognize, mm. because we-, we blame the child. We say, oh, Johnny's just being a- bad. Johnny's just acting out. Oh, you know, Susie is, is, is the wild child. You know, we-, we blame these kids for these things, whereas we as adults are the ones that need to understand. And this is part of, you know, why I- I'm-, I'm getting out there to-, to start spreading this information, because I think a lot of parents don't know. Sure. You know, I've had kids with ADHD start getting better by just eating an egg in the morning and then a turkey sandwich for lunch instead of the peanut butter and jelly. That's or if simple. they're having, even if they're having peanut butter and jelly, I, was, I tell the parents like put a mound of peanut butter. So there's, there's a huge amount of that fat, you know, not that I like peanut butter, but if that's what the kid eats, that's fine. Put a huge amount of the peanut butter, a tiny bit of jam so that the ratio of the fat and protein mm-hmm. to the sandwich and it works. So little things like this in, in the work that you're doing, and I, I'm so happy that people are paying attention to the work that you're doing, it can make a profound difference in these kids' lives. I love this. And I love that you did ADHD in air quotes, that it, it wasn't real. It's this mystical <laughs> diagnosis for certain kids. Um, the fact that such a simple change can kind of wipe that off their chart and out of their school day, incredible. Yeah. Um, you talked about three food groups that you prefer most kids take out. Is there a reverse? Are there certain foods or food groups or macros that are really calming and can really help HSCs and I'm guessing all kids to have their best day? Well, I, I think it, it's, it's really looking at the diet in a balanced fashion. Okay. So it isn't one food fixes everything or even a few foods fix everything. I mean, one, a lot of these children don't eat enough vegetables. So when there's the lack of fiber, there's the lack of vegetables. One, they're they're deficient in multiple vitamins and minerals. Mm. Two, because they're not getting enough of the prebiotics and the fiber, their bacteria are off balance. Okay. And I I see this a lot where if you go to a certain functional medicine doctor, they'll do a poop test. They'll say, oh, your bacteria are off. I'm going to do a bunch of things to fix your, to fix the gut without looking at why is this child not eating the vegetables they need to. You can't fix the gun until you change how the child is actually eating the the right foods to nourish the gut. Gosh, that's such a paradigm shift because I think so many people say, oh, my gut bacteria is off. I need more probiotics. I need a supplement. I need, you know, maybe some yogurt or sauerkraut or kimchi. But you're saying all the probiotics in the world are just going to fall flat if they have nothing to eat, which is prebiotics. Yeah. 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 And you know, it's not that I have anything against any of those things. I, 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 sauerkraut, kimchi, probiotics are all awesome. And I prescribe them all the time, Mm -hmm. but we have to take a step back and say, what is the foundational piece that's going to allow everything else to normalize? Because if a child is eating gluten, dairy, and you know, jam every day, all day, and that's all they eat, and that goes back to some of the sensory issues. Mm. So some of these kids, for instance, if you're a parent and your child cannot tolerate the texture of steak and they spit out steak or they avoid these dense foods, dried fruits are another one, they're chewy, tough foods. If they can't eat these and they spit them out and they've always spit them out, a lot of kids also even chicken, which Mm -hmm. is even less dense than steak, they they just can't eat it. So a lot of times what I do is I first work with a feeding therapist or an occupational therapist to restore the eating mechanism of the child. And slowly we phase out the gluten and dairy and then keep working on the veggies and keep working on the healthy foods and then start building it up. And in that, in, in that interim, I actually do other things unrelated to the gut. I'll put them on a probiotic, but I know it's not going to do much. Until we get the child eating the vegetables, and sometimes it's a six month, sometimes it's a 12 month process. Mm -hmm. But then once they start eating the vegetables and eating all of these foods, then I don't even need to worry about the probiotics and other things because I know that their gut is getting nourished and I know everything is going to start normalizing on its own because that's what the human body does. 
How great is that? I think two huge takeaways for all parents there is that, you know, going slowly is okay. We don't need to see massive changes in a week or a month or whatever. Um, and also that even, I mean, especially in the area of holistic medicine, it's not just take a pill. It's not just take the probiotics. It's this whole foundation, get everything back into balance. Probiotics is just a crutch to get to where your body can be in symbiosis. What's the opposite of dysbiosis? <laughs> To, to be balanced. Yeah. 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 And, you know, I think for people that are looking for a one fix pill, it doesn't exist. I mean, I, I, I looked for it. I spent years looking for it. I was part of that camp. You know, I was part of the camp of let me, let me just probiotic the kid. And I was giving kids, you know, literally 500 billion colonies of bacteria, which is a huge dose. And, mm -hmm you know, nothing would happen. And th th that was when I was scratching my head, like, what am I missing? You know, wh why is this not working? I've done the craziest protocols, you know, even more than what other people were doing. Nothing is working. And that's when I stood back and I stood back and I said, oh, yeah, it's because these kids can't eat, mm. you know? So how can you fix one thing when first you need to re reconnect the child with the foods, which is what you do? Mm -hmm. Reconnecting the child and family with food and helping the child eat the healthy food. And that becomes the foundation then for the probiotics and everything else to get in there and do the balancing. And that's when the really cool change happens. Yeah. So getting that diet right, it's kind of like the fertile soil for a garden. You know, when we're looking for a pill to work, it's like throwing out 5,000 seeds on a 10 by 10 plot that's completely parched, solid earth and going, huh, why is nothing growing? I don't get it, you know? So, right, you have to have the, the correct foundation, the correct ground. So you've talked about a couple sort of root causes or, or maybe problems that um, trip HSCs up because of their constitution. Talked about some like irritants, gluten, dairy, sugar, the blood sugar thing. Are there other root causes that when you look through all those 15 lenses, you target in on to help HSCs build, build, live their best life? Yeah. You know, another thing that I see uh, very often, I'd say about, you know, two to three out of five. So somewhere between 40 to even 60% mm -hmm. of the HSPs, HSCs have metabolic disorders. So metabolic disorders are basically how we process energy. So we take food and we have to ultimately turn that into ATP, which is basically our electricity. And okay. a lot of HSCs, HSPs are not efficient in doing this. So how, how, how do you know if you're one of them or if your child is one of them? Yep, that was my question. <laughs> you fatigue easily. So exercise, endurance kind of exercise is harder for you or your child than others. And that's when, you know, the indoor child, well, what, what does that mean? It means that the child gets tired from exertion. You know, and I'll ask parents like, okay, if, if your child goes in a playground, will they run for 40 minutes nonstop and climb and jump and do all of these things? I've had kids where when I ask this question, the parents stand back and they're like, yeah, you know, it's interesting. Johnny, when he plays soccer, he'll run after the ball for two minutes and literally stop midfield and just stop. Aww. And literally just let's go of the ball. And we're like, why, why is he doing that? You know, the parents never understood because it was weird to them. Mm -hmm. Or parents, when they take their children for a hike, presuming that the child isn't bored. But if the child is genuinely engaged in the hike and they're going uphill, if they suddenly, you know, two or three minutes into it, literally stop and can't walk anymore, that's not because they're being obstinate. It may be because metabolically they lack the energy to do so. And when children don't move their body in a relatively aggressive fashion, so if you think about it, like for instance, athletes or the kids that are, you know, very act physically engaged, not the hyperactive kids, but the kids mm -hmm. that are physically engaged, typically those are not the HSCs, right? The, you don't think of an athlete, the football player as someone that's the highly sensitive person. Sure, and quiet of, and Yeah. And some of that is because when there's that degree of muscle activation and physical activation, because we're engaging our vestibular system, which is basically our middle ear, all of this movement back and forth, up and down, side to side, that's actually rewiring the brain to handle sensory input. And if you look at what occupational therapists do, they actually put children in all of these suspension bridges and these tire swings. And what they're doing is they're activating these same parts of the brain pathways that some kids do naturally. Okay. So 
one of the things that actually works miracles for some of these kids are combination products that have CoQ10 and carnitine and B vitamins because those cluster of supplements can actually boost a metabolic activity which then suddenly has this child. And I, I had one child that literally just came back yesterday. She couldn't go, she's four years old, couldn't really go up and down stairs, would tire easily with any activity. She had been in six months of OT, hadn't gotten very far. I put her on a supplement and literally three weeks later, this kid is now running with all the other kids to the point where the mom is like, I have no idea who this kid is anymore because she is not the child that I'm used to. The OTs are floored because this little girl that was struggling with occupational therapy is now charging through it. She's running in the playground, doing all of these things she wasn't before, going up and down stairs. And it was just that she needed some, some supplements to boost her energy level to actually make everything fall into place. Wow. And, you know, the cool thing is, uh, if you follow any of the teaching of Terry Walls, like one of the things that I learned from her is that liver actually has a lot of ubiquinone, which is actually a metabolic supporter. Not, not that we should eat liver every day, all day, mm -hmm. but integrating these foods in modest amounts and taking some supplementation if needed can significantly change part of our constitution. And then the the indoor sensitive HSP may suddenly be the kid that's actually engaging with the world and being active in a way that we never imagined possible. What a beautiful result. So just to clarify, are you saying that some of those kind of rough and tough football players may have started life as an HSC or more tending toward being highly sensitive, but because they were active and spinning and tumbling, they rewired their own vestibular system? Um, not necessarily. Okay. So some can do that, but those are individuals that genetically have a very high degree of metabolic efficiency. Okay. So they're already, we, their constitution is already built for converting food into energy very efficiently? Yes. Yes. Okay. So it's, it. if it's like HSPs with metabolic issues are here and the athletes are here, you know, and there's the spectrum all the way through, uh, it, it's just a spectrum. And these are things that when we look at and really pay attention to all of a sudden we're like, oh my God, yeah, like look at that, it's there. Yeah, so and we're not saying that every human being ought to be a wild, you know, energetic athlete. Oh. We're just saying that if you don't have energy, you're not able to tap into all your gifts, period, yeah. right? Quiet, seated, standing, running or not. Um, is metabolic syndrome a one-to-one -one with high sensitivity? Like all highly sensitive people have metabolic syndrome, all people with metabolic syndrome are highly sensitive, or is there just a, a Venn diagram? Not necessarily. Okay. I, I would say it's, it's a spectrum. Mm -hmm. I'd say more highly sensitive people probably have metabolic issues than the rest of the population. Yep. And that's probably part of where their sensitivities came from. You know, they, sure. they, were the, they were the child that didn't crawl potentially or walk later. When they were walking, they were cautious. And, you know, with my own daughter, it's really interesting because I'm, I supplement her and sometimes we, we forget or, you know, my wife doesn't want me to or whatever and we stop. And you can actually see a noticeable difference in how she uses her body, the way she climbs, the way she jumps. And children don't, don't think, right? No. They just do. If they feel strong, they're, they, they're, they do something once and they feel good about it, they keep doing it. If they do it once and their body's a little weak, they, they're about to fall, they don't do it. So mm -hmm. when we change some of these pathways, we change the activity level of these children, which then allows a lot of other things to just naturally fall into place. Same thing with like the gut conversation, right? You change mm -hmm. the diet, you bring in the healthy foods, the bacteria just change. Same right. thing with the vestibular system and the processing. Yeah, and there's never one answer, right? Like we might, and there's never one type of HSP either. There's this whole spectrum where some are going to be, you know, more needing sensory processing rehabilitation. Some will need the metabolic rehabilitation. Are there other like major categories of root cause that parents can kind of keep an eye out for? Well, you know, I think one thing that, that happens often is uh, an adrenal insufficiency. So, you know, we, we describe adults as tired, but wired, you know, the adult that, that needs 15 cups of coffee just to get going, you know, a lot of adults, for instance, in the afternoons around two, three o'clock need some kind of pick me up because they're about to start snoring uh, at work or at home. So these are all signs of an adrenal issue. So if you, if you or your child have a hard time waking up in the morning or the child wakes up, they're super irritable, despite having a good night's rest, they finally get going. And then around two, three o'clock, 
you know, you've got the five-year-old that still needs to take a nap or the child becomes more tired or irritable in the afternoon. And usually what happens is around seven to eight o'clock, a lot of these kids also get a second wind. So they, uh -oh. or adults. I know that's not good. <laughs> no, no. But, you know, a lot of these individuals, I, I shouldn't even say children because adults sometimes have the same issue. They, they have a hard time falling asleep at night. So they're like, they were dragging and then out suddenly eight o'clock when they should be winding down, they're actually mm -hmm. wired and awake. These are all signs of an adrenal issue. And I see this in a disproportionately large amount in the HSPs in general, adults and children. And the most amazing thing is that this, this is so easy to treat. So there's a plant called black currant or Ribes nigrum in a gemotherapy that parents can buy off the shelf and just literally give their child a small amount of this. And it is weird. Literally within a week, maximum two weeks, suddenly you have a different child on your hand. And part of why I bring this up is it's not just a fatigue issue. When the adrenal glands are low, what happens is the nervous system actually kicks itself up into high gear to activate the adrenal glands because the nervous system is the accelerator for the adrenal glands. Okay. So you think about what they say, tired, but wired. Yep. They're wired. Individuals are wired because they're trying to activate their adrenal glands to produce the necessary hormones they need to live. Mm -hmm. We need cortisol. We need these hormones to be alive. I mean, and the body does not care about this. The body doesn't care about our mood. It doesn't care about how we think, you know, ultimately it wants us to be healthy and alive. That's the body's ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. And if, if it leaves you feeling anxious or causes your child to be kind of crazy, the body doesn't care. So a lot of times when we boost adrenal gland function, the nervous system suddenly says like, oh, cortisol, everything is good. I, I can relax. So it's like the body takes its foot off the accelerator. And what I see in a lot of families, what they tell me is the kids that were tantruming stop tantruming. The kids that have difficulty with transitions. So kids oh, that, that yeah. are like freaking out suddenly don't have issues with transitions. They, they easily go from one thing to another and it's not a big deal. The kids have any, they wake up happy in the mornings. They go to sleep more easily. A lot of these things shift and it's a pretty profound shift once it's there to the point where the parents are like, holy cow, this is like gold to me. And it, it's just a plant. Yeah, I can guarantee a lot of people were shaking their heads on like that difficult transition phrase. <laughs> and they're like, immediately they're on Amazon right now. <laughs> how do I do this? Is this like, by the way, is this like a powder or a capsule or how do we administer no, this to kids? It's, it's, a, it's a glycerin okay. extract. So it's a gemotherapy, which are basically glycerin plant extracts that you can find on Amazon. There's another okay. website called Pure Formulas that, uh -huh. that, that sells the Ribes nigrum. And you can easily get it and, you know, give your child one or two milliliters of it. Uh, the one caveat I'll just say is if the parent gets a little uh, overexcited and overdoses the child, there's no toxicity with it, okay. but too much of it for the highly sensitive wire child actually causes them to be hyper. Oh. So you, you want to start off really slow and slowly titrate up to find that sweet point for the child if you're doing it on your own, because you don't want to overload them. Got it. Very good. Well, we will, uh, I'll find some links and kind of run them by you to make sure they're sure, Dr. K sure. approved. We'll <laughs> include sure. them in and I, I think I have an adrenal handout that I can give you oh, that you yeah. can share with your audience, which kind of covers the dosing and different plants and all of that. Mm -hmm. Oh, that would be fantastic. Um, Dr. K, this has been so good. Like, I don't know what other people are doing in their brains, but as I think a highly sensitive person in myself, I'm always overthinking and rethinking and thinking yeah, again. Yeah. Um, and I'm like, oh yeah, my kid who I was pretty sure was an HSC, like ticks that box, ticks that box. And so, I mean, I, I know I'm going to be implementing some of this stuff very, very soon. Um, and I can't wait. By the time this video airs, I might even have, you know, some, some results to share about how we've helped our highly sensitive kids feel better about their day. Cause that's the thing, right? It's not a disorder to be highly sensitive, but we can, we can like support our high sensitivity in this world of overstimulation, or we can just like let our kids drown. Right. And we don't want to do that. We don't want them there's to no feel need. that suffering. No. There's, so, there's I mean, no I, need. yeah. And this has been, I mean, such a helpful conversation and very much full of hope. So I love to leave parents with like, like the one super practical step that they can accomplish, whether it's observation or taking an action for a quick win. Like what would you tell parents to walk away and like, you should do this this week? You know, I would say the easiest quick win is that black current. 
Okay. You know, ultimately, at the end of the day, I want parents to change the diet and to really follow your work and bring in the vegetables. But that's not a quick win. That's a, that's a marathon. Yeah. Quick win. If if you want something, it is you know try that. If you see that pattern, grumpy in the mornings, you know, difficult with transitions, crashes in the afternoons, gets that second win. It, it is pretty much guaranteed that there's an adrenal issue, and the black current could be magical for this. That's awesome. Thank you You're so welcome. very You're much. Welcome. Incredibly and, helpful. And yeah, people should definitely follow your work because I think you're getting to the point, yes, where you're able to kind of go a little more global, not just yeah. in your practice. Yeah. And within the next several weeks, we'll actually have our information website on. So there's a new, actually outside of my clinic, I'm, I'm creating a website called Holistic Minds with a W. Mm -hmm. And that website is just to get information out about these kinds of things. And in, in not too long, I'll actually have a big information library that's free access for everyone, where I actually have interviews from the top metabolic person and mold person and hormones. So parents can actually go browse the library and watch what these people are talking about so they can see from the expert all of the little nuances that make us who we are, except we don't know that these things are making us who we are. And there is so much we can do. That's the, that's the part that drives me. There's so much we can do to help. And diet is foundation. But when you bring all the pieces together, that's when magic happens. It is a beautiful picture. And thank you for channeling all of your high sensitivity and awareness of the world into our kids and into this passion for just helping our kids live better lives. And I, I feel like a lot of, some of at least these strategies apply to non-highly sensitive kids as well. You know, just kids who are, and maybe I'm wrong because maybe all mine are highly sensitive. I don't know, but I feel like a lot of kids could use a little support in different ways. And, and even just kind of turning on our parent detective brains to say, you know, what can we observe? What can we see in our kids where, you know, A causes B or X might be related to Y and just, you know, just help them live their best lives. That's what we all want to do for sure. So again, thank you so much for being here, Dr. K. You're welcome. And thank you for sharing this message with your audience and helping people understand that these possibilities are out there. Most absolutely. And I will see you guys in the audience back next week with another expert who has the information you need to raise super healthy kids. Thank you for being here. Bye.